So in our last lecture, we finished talking about the quantum picture of hydrogen atom. So, so far what we know is by solving the Schrodinger equation, you can get everything you want about the hydrogen atom, or in general, any atom that has only one electron. But we need to live in the reality, right? We're chemists, we can't just deal with hydrogen atom alone. We need to talk about atoms with more electrons in them. And in order for that to happen, we want to first look at the complication of the system, and then we'll introduce some of the simplification approach we use, try to describe those multi-electron atoms. So, just as we were talking about everything is quantum mechanics, so we use the Schrodinger equation to describe what is taking place in multi-electron systems as well. So for the hydrogen atom, this is a general form of the Schrodinger equation. Again, it's a differential equation. By solving the Schrodinger equation, you can get a wave function that effectively tells you everything about the particle you're interested in. For the hydrogen atom, which is showing here, it's pretty much well defined, right? So if we're assuming the nucleus is not moving and we're just focusing on the electron itself, it's a pretty nice, well-defined problem. We have this Laplacian term, which is my kinetic term. And then we have this potential term, which is my Coulomb's potential. And since we only have one electron and one nuclei, the Coulomb's potential is simply just um, negative ZE squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r. Right, just because we only have two charged particles, the relationship between these two particles is pretty straightforward. But when we take just one step further along the periodic table, when we're looking at the helium atom, which has two electrons, this relationship all of a sudden becomes very complicated, becomes impossible to human beings to get an analytical solution out of it. When the analytical solution means you actually have a mathematical representation for the wave function. So again, it's the same idea, right? So these Laplacian term, these are my kinetic term. But then for my potential term, now I have three different potential terms. The first one is the attraction. between nuclei and electron wall. And here is the attraction between nuclei and electron two. So these two are hard, but still it's okay to think about what they might be. The most challenging one here it's the repulsion between electron one and electron two. All right, so now what we have is instead of having just one pair of that Coulomb's potential, we have three different pairs of the Coulomb potential. Two are attracted between the two electrons and the nuclei, and one being repulsive between the two electrons. And in the meantime, the position of those electrons are gonna affect each other. So that's what it means when we say now we have this term that's depend on the relative position of two electrons. And this term makes it impossible to actually solve the Schrodinger equation analytically. It means it's hard, it's impossible for human beings to get a mathematical representation of what the wave function for helium look, actually looks like. So I'm going to use um, one of the famous quotes by Paul Dirac. You probably already see it. I'm just going to read it to you. So basically what we have is fundamental laws necessary for mathematical treatment of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry. That means if you solve the Schrodinger equation, if you have the wave function of those electrons, you know everything about chemistry, right? Energy levels, momentum, whatever you want. By solving the wave function, you should be able to get it theoretically. But the problem here is that the difficulty lies only in the fact that application of these laws 
leads to equations that are too complex to solve. So that comes back to the, our helium example, is theoretically, if we can solve the Schrodinger equation to get the actual form of the wave function, we know everything about the electron. But the problem is we just cannot solve for the wave function via the analytical way. Again, we're chemists, so we want to live in a world that we're not only dealing with hydrogen atoms or one electron cations. So that's why we want to introduce some approximation that can help us to extend our understanding on the hydrogen atom to slightly more complicated um, atoms with multiple electrons. So one of the fundamental approximation we're gonna use for this class is called the orbital approximation for atoms. So if you stay in chemistry or physics long enough, you'll see other approximations that helps people um, to solve for the wave functions for more complicated electrons uh, and atoms. All right, so in the orbital approximation for atoms, what we're saying as we're making the assumption that wave function of electrons can be approximated as a product of different hydrogenic atomic orbitals. So what we're saying that is we know that the atomic orbitals or the soft electron wave functions are gonna be slightly different depending on what kind of atom you are. But we're taking the assumption that the shape of these atomic orbitals or the general form of these electronic wave functions we saw for hydrogen atom is going to remain the same when we're looking at more complicated atoms. And then each atomic orbitals are associated with discrete energy levels. And here we have this little alpha sign that gets you the specific set of quantum numbers. And we discussed a quantum number before. Right? You have the n quantum number, which tells you the principal quantum number, um, tells you what energy level you have. We have the angular momentum quantum number, L, which gives you like what kind of orbital it is, what kind of shape of this atomic orbital you should expect. S orbital is a spherical shape. The P orbital is more of a dumbbell shape, and D orbital and vice versa. And then the third one we're saying, in a neutral atom with atomic number Z, we can use this electron, um, electronic structure by just putting the electrons into the corresponding atomic orbitals. So again, these are the atomic orbitals we're talking about, right? So let's say this is 1s, 2s, 2p, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can just put electrons in there, and we're going to uh, follow some of the rules by putting those electrons in, and we're going to discuss that in very soon. So for 1s, 2s, 2p, and so on. So before we move on to the next lecture, which is actually talking about effective nuclear charge and electron configurations, I want to pause here and ask you to think a little bit. So remember in the Bohr model, or in hydrogen atom, we have the energy level equals to z negative z squared over n squared. That's in right birth. So I want you to quickly think about it. Why we have different energy levels for s orbital and p orbitals, especially the 2s and 2p. So keep thinking about it when we're talking about the next topic. All right, so this is what we call the break of degeneracy. And we'll be talking about why there is a break of degeneracy very soon. So the take home question where, you, where we're talking about, think about it. Why the 2s and 2p atomic orbital have different energy levels? Okay, so I'm going to switch note here to our lecture 10. And in this one, we're going to start by talking about effective nuclear charge. And by talking about effective nuclear charge, we will eventually answer the question why your 2s and 2p have different energy levels. So remember we were talking about, well, I want to say last lecture, but just right before, we talked about those atoms with multiple electrons are too hard to solve. So that's why we introduced the idea of the effective nuclear charge to trying to at least capture some idea about how does those um, other electrons can affect your electron of interest or your valence electrons that are most in involved in your chemical reactions. So 
the basic idea here is when we're talking about effective nuclear charge, is that your valence electron at the outmost shell of your um, atom may not feel the fall of your nuclear charge. So what does it mean? So if we have just one hydrogen, it has one um, nuclei in the middle, and then electrons surround, I mean, electron clouds around it. What it means is your 1s electron in your hydrogen atom is going to feel the nuclei as pretty much a point charge. There's nothing else to interfere with that electron nuclei interaction in your hydrogen atom. So that's your most simple case. However, when we're looking into systems with more than one electron, let's use the lithium as an example that has three electrons. So in here, it's natural to think that it has two 1s electron. And then one 2s electron. And the way I'm drawing it here, so the blue circle is where we predict the electron density of the one electron to be um, higher, where the yellow circle is where we predict the 2s electron density to be higher. And, and this um, part here, remember the, the reason we have those little bands between the two yellow circles is because there's an angular no um, radial node in your 2s atomic orbital. So in here, we have electrons in my low energy 1s atomic orbital. So the two 1s electrons are my inner share electrons. They're going to feel stronger from your nuclei. Alternatively, the electrons in the 2s atomic orbital, they're further away. So they're this yellow part. They're further away from the nuclei. And the negatively charged electron 1 and 2 in the blue circle it's going to somewhat cancel out the positive charge from the nuclei in parts. So the result here, when we're looking at the shell model, is seeing the inner shell electrons will shield electron stray from full charge of the entire nuclei. So that's what, what we're talking about when we're talking about shielding, is you have inner shell electrons that can somewhat cancel out the attractive force from the nuclei and make the outer shell electrons feel less of that positive charge from the nucleus. So the positive charge that outer shell 2s electron feels is what we call effective core potential. So we have a simplified model to estimate this um, effective core potential. And these just work for s orbitals. We'll talk about p orbitals very soon. So for s orbitals, we have the effective core potential somewhat roughly equals to z. So that's my atomic number. And then the number of inner shell electrons. So if we're taking my lithium as an example, so z equals to 3, this number of inner shell electrons are my two 1s electrons. And then one half number of the same orbital electrons. So in my 2s electrons, I have only one. So the number of the same orbital electrons excluding itself is just zero. So for lithium, we can do that calculation. We have three minus two, it just gives you minus zero just gives you one. We'll see some more practice very soon, but here is a highly simplified model to describe the um, effective core potential. So that's just for the S atomic orbitals. We have a simplified model to give you a number. For the P and D atomic orbitals, it's much harder to actually have an equation that gives you a number. But we can still understand it uh, via a qualitative fashion. So for P and D atomic orbitals, now we're dealing with atomic orbitals that has an angular node at the nuclei or close to the nuclei. So the result of those angular nodes 
makes the P and D shielding effect different from the S orbitals. So the S orbital are the spherical orbitals. You experience four shielding effects from S orbitals. So let's look at the P atomic orbitals. And this one, um, let's just work on it together and see what's going to happen. Imagine we have a nuclei here. And then we have electrons in 2s atomic orbitals. I'm going to draw it in black. Let me center it here. And then at the same time, we have our 2p atomic orbitals. So AO stands for atomic orbitals. I sometimes just simplify it. All right, so the blue one is on my 2p atomic orbitals. So just draw one of them, for example. And for my 2p atomic orbitals, it has an angular node around the nuclei. It means there's low electron density region of my 2p electrons around the node. So what we have here is that electrons in the 2s atomic orbital will shield electrons in 2p atomic orbitals more. And the reason is because in the 2p atomic orbital, we have the angular node. And consequently, around this angular node, where I'm sketching in green, these are the low electron density regions. For 2p electrons. So it's a qualitative understanding. We have two different atomic orbitals that roughly occupy the same um, space. They have the same principal quantum number. The only difference is their angular momentum quantum number, or L, or the shape of your atomic orbitals. So because the S atomic orbitals has a more spherical shape, it is more effectively <laughs> shielding the 2p electrons. Alternatively, the 2p atomic orbital has this dumbbell shape with an angular momentum, um, angular, with the angular node in the middle around the nuclei. So the 2p atomic orbitals, um, the 2p electrons in its atomic orbitals shield the 2s electrons a little bit less. All right, so this is a qualitative understanding I, should, I hope you can get. Do we have any questions on this one? All right, so the take home message here is that the, for um, atomic orbitals of the same principal quantum number n, we have the effective core potential for ns orbitals. It's going to be bigger than that for the np and bigger than that for the nd. All right, so the n, as long as your principal quantum number n is the same, your s orbitals shield p and d more. And then your p and d atomic orbitals shield your s orbital a little bit less. All right. So what's the consequence here? We talk about our energy equation, right? So this is the picture we have for the hydrogen atom when we're not considering shielding, is z square over n square in right word. So for hydrogen atom, this z just equals, there's no shielding, so your, so your z is just one for all your atomic orbitals. So for your hydrogen atom, what we're expecting is, as long as your n quantum number is the same, your 2s and the 3 2p are expected to have the same energy levels. 
So this is what we call degenerated atomic orbitals. Or degenerated is the same as saying they have the same energy. So for hydrogen atom, your 2s and 2p are expected to be degenerated because your energy only depends on the principal quantum number n. However, for all multi-electron atoms, instead of using that simple equation, now we need to take consideration of the shielding effect. So your energy equation now becomes Z effective squared N squared, also in Rydberg. So this is for any multi-electron systems. So the effect of the other electron on your electron of interest is taken consideration by the effective core potential. And also we just derived that the, the effective for 2s is going to be larger than the effective of 2p atomic orbital. So remember, this is because of the shielding effect and your 2p atomic orbital has an angular node at the middle. As a result, what we can derive taking these two equations together, what we have is that the energy of 2s is going to be smaller or more negative than energy of 2p atomic orbitals. And if we draw it out on the energy diagram, we still have the 1s being way low in, in the energy level that diagram because it has a um, smaller principal quantum number. And then we have the 2s and the 2p. So our 2p are still degenerated. Right, so I still have three 2p atomic orbitals of the same energy level. But here, when we're looking at 2p and 2s, now they have different energy level, and we call them breaking degeneracy. Right. So here's a, this is a quick explanation on why we're using the effective core potential. What's the consequence of effective core potential? And why your 2s and 2p atomic orbital actually ends up with different energy levels? You with me so far? Okay, sounds good. So that's the conceptual part, and these are basically, I just write it down. You can refer to them on my annotated note if you, wrote, you, if you want to read it yourself. What we're saying is first, for hydrogen atom, we have the atomic orbitals of the same principal quantum number n all have the same energy level. However, in the multi-electron atoms, now we're taking consideration of the shielding effect. So instead of using the atomic number Z, we're using the effective core potential in the energy equation. So this equation, this is the, one of the questions people usually ask is what energy equation I should be using, right? So you want to think about why, what's the difference between these equations? So this is what we call the equation for multi-electron systems because we're using the shielding effect to take consideration of the effect of other electrons to your electron of interest. So you use this equation for multi-electron problems. And let's do one practice problem, one last practice on the shielding effect together. Let's consider, can we draw the energy level diagram of carbon atomic orbitals? Um, we'll just stop at 2p because that's the valence atomic orbital or the outmost atomic orbital for our high carbon atom. So we want to draw this um, energy diagram in a quantitative fashion. So by say quantitative, as I do want to label what the energy level we have in this energy diagram. So let's look at it. 
first thing, we can calculate the effective core potential for electrons in different orbitals. So this is the general equation. Let's look at the Z effective for 1s. That's roughly equals to 6 minus inner shell. There's nothing that's more inner shell comparing to my 1s. So when I say inner shell, it means that the um, principal quantum number n is smaller than the atomic orbital of interest. So now I'm looking at 1s. There's nothing that's smaller than 1 minus 0 minus 1 half times the same orbital electron. So we have two electrons in the 1s atomic orbital for carbon. So that's 1 half times 1. That's roughly equals to 5 and half. For the 2s, again, we start from 6 minus the inner shell. Now we're looking at 2s. So we have two inner shell electrons from 1s, atomic orbital, minus 1 half times. So here, when we say the same orbital, we're taking consideration of all atomic orbital with the same principal quantum number n. So in this case, we have 1s. We have two of them. We have 2 in 2s, 2 in 2p. So a total of four electrons in with principal quantum number n. So here, we're going to have three. That's roughly equals to 2 and 2.5. And we cannot calculate the effective core potential for 2p, but we know that's going to be smaller than the 2s. All right, yes? Well, it's not spherical, so we don't have a good easy to follow estimation for the 2p. So this equation applies for um, S spherical orbitals only. Now we have the number for the effective core potential. We have the energy equation for the um, atomic orbitals of different effective core potential. And we can write out the energy level. So we know that for En, that equals to negative. The effective square over n square, that's in Rydberg. And we can write out the energy for 1s. That's roughly equals to 5.5 squared over 1. That's about negative 30 Rydberg. For 1s, we have, for 2s, we have negative 2.5 squared over 1. That's roughly equals to 6.3, right? Word. And again, we cannot calculate for 2p, and I don't expect you to give me a quantitative number, but you need to know that um, 2p is going to be larger than 2s because of the shielding effect. And now we can plot out our energy level diagram. All right, so what we have here is just one direction. That's my energy level. For my 1s atomic orbitals, and say the energy is in right work. For my 1s atomic orbitals, that's about negative 30. That's what we just calculated. And then for the 2s atomic orbitals, that's about negative 6.3. And then for the 2p atomic orbitals, that's going to be slightly higher. Right. So now we have our energy level diagram ready, and we're ready to assign electrons to these empty atomic orbitals. See if we have questions before we move on. Yes. For the 
Uh, it's two. It's not one. Oh, this one? Oh, yeah, I have got it wrong. Sorry. That should be two. Did I do that calculation wrong as well? Maybe. Yeah, I need to update that number, but thank you for pointing that out. Any other questions? For the z-effective, we're using this equation to estimate what the z-effective is. So the idea behind this equation is we start from the total amount of nuclear charge available at the nuclei minus the inner shell electrons and minus the one half times the same orbital electrons. Does that, did, that, did that answer your question? Well, so this is Z, that's your atomic orbital, that's where the six comes from for carbon. For the inner shell electrons, for one S, the principal quantum number is already at its lowest possible state. There's no inner shell electrons. So that's why it's zero for one S, for inner shell electron numbers. And at the same time, we have two one S atom, um, electrons, so there's one more electron of the same orbital. So that's where that one half times one comes from. All right? Yes? For two S, why is it, um, why is the number three only an electron three? Right, so the question is why is this number three here? So here when we're saying the same orbital electron, you take consideration of all electrons with the same principal quantum number n. So in this case, we're looking at carbon. So we have two 1s atomic orbital, uh, 1s electrons, two 2s and two 2p. So in total, we have four electrons with the principal quantum number uh, uh, two. So four minus one, that's where that three comes from. Did I answer your question there? So the last part here is for my carbon atom. We have two 2s electrons and two 2p electrons. So although they're in different atomic orbitals, they, both, they all have the same principal quantum number, which is two. So when we're taking this part, you want to count the number of electrons with the same principal quantum number two. So in this case, we have four electrons with principal quantum number two. So where, where, that's where that four comes from. Four minus one, that's where that three comes from. Why is it, uh, it doesn't consider itself, right? So it, you're, we're trying to figure out how does other electrons affecting our electron of interest. Okay, one last question before we move on. Or I guess not. And then we're ready to move on to talk about electron configurations or how to put in the electrons into our soft energy diagrams. So in here, we have two fundamental rules we need to follow. If you already took it in AP chemistry, it's gonna be a quick review. First one is called the Pauli exclusion principle. In plain language, what it says is there's no two electrons in the same atom that can have the same set of all four quantum number. So we have four different quantum number. Remember, N, L, and M, these tells you what atomic orbital it is. And MS, that's electron spin. So electron spin tells you whether it's spin up or spin down. Tell the physical meaning of electron spin is how does your electron react to an external magnetic field. So no two electrons in the same atomic orbital have the same electron spin. And then the Hunt rule, is when electrons are pairing with each other, they need to undergo somewhat of a penalty, and that penalty is called electron pairing energy. So what it means is when electrons in enter degenerated atomic orbitals, you will have one single electron in every orbital before you put in the second one. So it doesn't make any sense by just reading it, so we'll do one quick example here. Let's just look at the um, electron configuration for carbon, where we have Z equals to six. And we write it out, our energy diagram. We have our 1s, 2s, 
2s and 2p atomic orbitals. So we have a total of six electrons. So we put it in, one up, one down, one up, one down, and then one up for each atomic orbitals. Or when we're writing the electron configuration, we say carbon is 1s2, means there are two electrons in the 1s atomic orbital, 2s2 and 2p2. You could also use the um, noble gas notation, so like helium, 2s2, 2p2. And here for this part, we call them valence electrons. Do another example here, maybe let's say oxygen. That has Z equals to H. So again, let's have one S, two S, 2p. Z equals to 8, so we're putting electrons in. 1 up, 1 down. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So you're filling, um, so you put one electron in those degenerated atomic orbital first before you're pairing them up. And the electron configuration for oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Or it's also equivalent to say that's helium, 2s2, 2p4. Yes? Uh, right, we're doing oxygen here, but what I'm saying is a noble gas notation. What it means is um, these 1s2, they're both filled. It pretty much resembles a helium um, atom. So that's the noble gas notation. You can also write it all up, but eventually you'll see when we get to more complicated atoms, it becomes quite um, tedious to write out the full electron configuration. And by just looking at these um, electron configuration, you can get some idea about these atoms themselves. For example, we have the paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. So when we say paramagnetic, it means it's going to be attracted into the magnetic field. So we're just imagine now you have just carbon atom in gas phase. If it's like paramagnetic, it means it has unpaired electrons, which it is. We have two unpaired electrons in the 2p atomic orbitals. Means that gas phase atom sample is going to be attracted into a magnetic field. In contrast, we also have diamagnetic substance, means that it's going to be pushed out from a magnetic field. So a substrate with no unpaired electrons are called diamagnetic. So these are just nomenclatures we use to describe whether or not an atom is, has electrons all paired up or has unpaired electrons. Paramagnetic, unpaired electrons. Diamagnetic, all paired up. And these are the energy levels for the atomic orbitals. So if essentially, you can actually solve for these energy levels. Um, but some of them are less counterintuitive. For example, here, we have the 4s atomic orbital get filled up before the 3d atomic orbital. So that's for the transition metals. And also, we have 6s filled before 4s and then 5d. So before we move on to our new topic, I want to quickly go over the electron configuration for transition metals because they are somewhat special. They're different from the main group elements. All right. So the reason electron configuration for transition metals are somewhat different is because of the d atomic orbitals. So this part is a little bit hard to explain. So um, because we don't have numbers behind it. But the reason we have the 4s atomic orbital 
being lower than the 3D atomic orbital is again because of the shielding effect. So in here, we're comparing the 4S with 3D. And we look at the energy equation, right? So the energy equals to negative Z effective squared over N squared. So if we look at the quantum number N, we're expecting the 4S to have a lower, um, the higher energy because your quantum number N here is larger. But if we look at the effective um, core potential or the shielding effect, we also know that the D electrons shield the S less and S shield the D more. So it's a delicate balance. And again, when we're talking about the shielding effect, let's just look at dxy as an example. And we plot out our dxy. Straight dxy, for example. And this 3dxy has two angular nodes. And it's going to shield all the other atomic orbitals way less comparing to S and P atomic orbitals. Or the other way to put it is that the D orbitals are more shielded. So we're expecting the D atomic orbitals to have smaller Z effective. So now we have the effective core potential and the principal quantum number actually works against each other, um, which, which is the chemistry or the physics behind that weird trend that your 4S atomic orbital gets filled before the 3D atomic orbitals. So this is a little bit of the extra. For this course, um, you just need to know that most of the transition metal have the configuration of somewhat of a noble gas. And then your S atomic orbital is going to field before the D atomic orbitals. So that's where that NS comes from, right? So the S atomic orbital is field before the D atomic orbitals. And occasionally, you can also have the NS atomic orbital relatively uh, singly occupied before the D atomic orbital being filled up. And for cations, or when you're removing electrons from the transition metal center, it's actually really weird because the S atomic orbital electrons are going to be removed before the D electrons. So what you would expect is when everything is empty, the 4S is going to be lowering energy comparing to the 3D. So that's why the 4S atomic orbital is being filled before the 3D atomic orbitals. But once you popped one electron into a D atomic orbital, the energy level of these two atomic orbitals is going to switch. So that's why when you're making cations from the transition metals, um, the S electrons are getting removed before the D electrons. So I don't like to ask you to remember, but this is one of the moments that I can't explain it to any more detail. You probably just need to remember for transition metals, S get filled first and S electrons get removed first as well. So some of the examples here is when we're saying um, when the transition metal is being ionized, electrons in the S orbital are removed. So let's take iron as an example. I'm just going to put a periodic table out. So for iron, we can write its electron configuration as argon. 3d6, 4s2. But when we're looking at the iron cation, say we have iron 2 plus, or we can also write it as a different notation. The electron configuration is going to be argon 3d6. All right. 
So when you're taking the electron out, you take it from the s orbital first. When you're putting electron in, you put it in the s orbital first as well. Yes. So the reason behind it is the relative energy um, relative energy level of your d and s atomic orbitals, because your four d and your three d and four s are so similar in energy. When the electron is being popped into your d atomic orbital, its energy is going to drop. It's it's really hard to imagine. So this is one of the few moments I would hope you just remember it and get it right in the in in the following applications. Okay. So I left some problems here um, in your blank note that you can actually see and in the annotated note. So this part is pretty much just, you go to the periodic table and then you pick whatever element you like. You assign the electron configuration there and like check it with Google or with your textbook and see if you get it right. So I'm going to skip this pre uh, practice because I really want to finish the photoelectron spectroscopy. So we have five minutes. I'm going to go over the very foundation of the photoelectron spectroscopy. These will probably not show up on your midterm exam for uh, midterm one, but maybe in the final. So in the photoelectron spectroscopy, what we have is, again, it's somewhat like your photoelectric experiment. But in this case, instead of using the photocathode, which is a piece of metal, what we have is just a gas phase sample. Right? And we're trying to use light as the energy source to excite those gas phase sample and get the electrons ejected from that gas phase sample. So the idea here is to use the photoelectric spectroscopy to measure the ionization energy from different atomic orbitals. So this diagram might look familiar to you because we saw it in the photoelectric experiment. What we have is we start from the energy of the photon, right? We shine the sample with a beam of light containing energy energy of the photon equals to h mu. And then this part, instead of that work function where we're talking about the photocathode, now we have the ionization energy of different atomic orbitals. And once the electron being ejected, being ionized from that atomic orbital, it's being ejected with certain kinetic energy. And one can measure that kinetic energy, and by taking the difference, we can get a measure of what the ionization energy is for each atomic orbital. So how do we interpret it, a photoelectron spectrum? So what we have here is imagine we have neon that has 1s, 2s, and 2p electrons. What's going to happen is when the photo beam shoot it, the electrons are going to be ejected with different energy. So here we have kinetic energy 1, 2, and 3. And what that means is these are the kinetic energy of that electron that's being ejected. So if we put it on the energy diagram that we had before, what we have is imagine this is an energy diagram. And then we have 1s, 2s, 2p. And at the very top, we have the n equals to infinity that equals to zero. So that n equals to infinity means that an electron is being ejected as infinitely away from your nuclei. So when we're looking at the ionization energy, right? so the smallest difference here is from your highest energy atomic orbital, which is my 2p atomic orbital. And then here we have the ionization of 2s and 1s. So it goes back to the kinetic energy that's being, um, that's being of those electrons that's being ejected. So the 2p electrons will have highest kinetic energy because ionization energy is small. Vice versa, the 1s atomic orbitals are going to have the smallest kinetic energy because its ionization energy is big. And then in order to translate the ionization energy into atomic orbital energy levels, we're going to use what we call the Koopmans approximation. So 
So what it means is if we have this diagram here, again, on the top, we have E n equals to infinity, that equals to zero. And on the bottom, we have some energy level from atomic orbital in L. And this difference here is my ionization energy of that specific atomic orbital. Or the other way to put it is that ionization energy is the negative of the energy of the atomic orbital. Or ionization energy of an L atomic orbital equals to negative of E and L and vice versa. I will do one example with you on our Friday lecture on these problems, but they won't show up on your midterm one. Okay, thank you very much there.